Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. Uh, Mander... Manderley? Manderley. Are you sure? I'm pretty positive. Uh, all right, because They I... all say it in the movie. Well, and yeah, the way it's spelled people, right here, Manderley. People say it differently in the movie, because I'm sure Olivia said Manderley, not Manderley. Or were you watching Star Wars? Is there a Manderley in Star Wars? There's yeah. a Mandalorian. So overrated. There's Mandalay Bay. Never been. Same. Also, Mandalorian, I know you keep get, trying to get me to watch that show, but I I, I don't know. Because I know I just didn't get into Mandalorian because I had just written off Star Wars pretty much completely after the movie trilogy. Well, that and you hate everything that I love. Uh, that's a lie because I, I really like this movie. This movie was really good. Which, you know, the, the heavens parted. I couldn't believe that Dean enjoyed a movie that I, I picked. I dare anyone here to go back and watch any of the episodes of Becky's Picks and I can guarantee you I enjoyed the vast majority of them. Adam's Family Values? Yeah, that's the one movie I disliked. The one. Name one other one. Go. All any. the other ones. That's a lie and you know it. Uh-huh. But welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And every week we pick a new movie to talk about, and this week we're talking about... Rebecca. And it's also the first week of December, so happy December. Happy December. And we're, you know, starting off our Hitchcock month with Rebecca. Yeah, uh, never saw it before. I knew a lot about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure I read the book at some point, because I... Watching the movie, I recognized all the plot stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, I recognize this from a story or something else I read, but... Or I, a documentary, maybe? Maybe, or like, a, I read excerpts of it from mm. like a like a Hitchcock book, something. But um, this stars Laurence Olivier, uh, Joan Fontaine, Jane Fontaine? Yeah, it stars L- Laurence Olivier, Joan Fontaine. It's got, you know, a long laundry list of characters in this movie. Yeah, and a lot of character actors of the time, because this comes out in 1940, and most of the people in this movie were, like, British stage or British character Mm -hmm. actors that Hitchcock brought over when he came to Hollywood. Yeah, and this was his first American film. And, I mean, kind of a way to go on your first American film. It was nominated for 11 Academy Awards. It won two, including Best Picture. Yeah, and Best Cinematography, right? Yeah, that's no longer a category, right? No, Best Cinematography is a category. Is it? Yeah, no, no, no. You're thinking because the Best Picture was called something else. It was called Best Production. Oh, okay. And that no longer... It do, it exists, but it's just called Best Picture Best now. Best Picture, okay. Because I know I had read somewhere that one of the awards isn't what it used to be, so that's what I assumed. I'm like, is it Best Cinematography? But why would they change that? Because Cinematography... It's so still important. it's still in it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that there was a few of those Oscars that they don't do anymore, and there's some that go in and out, like in the '60s. I don't mm-hmm. think special effects was in every '60s Oscar. They went like in and out every couple of yeah. years. But um, yeah, in this movie, it's it's really good to see Hitchcock coming into an American studio system. This is done by David Oselznick, and I think during the production of this he was finishing up gone with the wind yeah and i mean him and hitchcock were just bumping heads because hitchcock is hitchcock and he likes to do his things his way yeah and oselznick was kind of like no i'm the producer i'm the money and hitchcock was like no trust me i know what i'm doing well it's really true because david oselznick i guess this is like old school Hollywood. Mm-hmm. This is this is actual Hollywood Golden Age stuff. Yeah. Uh he was like the biggest producer in the world. He was doing Gone with the Wind, which became the biggest movie in the yeah. world. And he brought Hitchcock over in his studio system because he's like, hey, this guy's doing a lot of big waves in England. Mm-hmm. He's making some hits. If I get him locked into a contract over here, he, if he makes one or two good movies, I paid I paid off his contract. That's fine. And Hitchcock, yeah, he's really, like, a picky person, but this movie, you can tell, is Hitchcock compromising to David O. Salznick. Yeah. Because a lot of the stuff in the movie, you can tell, is something that's not, like, Hitchcockian in its core. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of the camera work, there's not a lot of, like, built-in suspense and tension like a normal Hitchcock film is. Yeah. But it's fascinating, because so much of this movie... I can see echoed in Vertigo, which is 
mm-hmm. everyone says is Hitchcock's most Hitchcock movie. Yeah, and it's really weird because, like you were saying, this feels like a Hitchcock movie, but it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you could kind of, you know, go in between this feels like, you know, early golden age of Hollywood where they're dancing and there's a love story and, then you know, there's the twist of Hitchcock. And it's like, it's a really good fusion. Yeah, I can see where you're getting at. It's definitely a movie of its time that really holds up for a movie of its time. Because there's movies like, I mean, I'll bring it up again, Gone with the Wind, I don't think is a movie that holds up to 2022 standards anymore. It One, it's four hours long. Yeah, it's a really long movie to sit through. The, the content in the movie is, is questionable at best. Questionable and... Uh... There's but, certain things about our leading characters that are not exactly kosher anymore. Yeah, but on the flip side, you have the artistry of Gone with the Wind. You know, these huge sets and... The magnificent production. It, the The look of that movie is still uh, something to behold. You I know, mean, the fact that it's not a black and white movie. It's, uh, you know... Full technicolor. Full technicolor, and you feel like you're there in person. I got to see Gone with the Wind on the big screen. <sighs> maybe i think it was before the pandemic oh god and okay. i was like i don't know how i'm gonna sit through this but let's do it and just seeing it on a big screen is like wow you really feel like you're stepping into this movie but that that's like gone with the wind yeah. which look i thought we could cover that at one <laughs> point but it would it, that would be something that would take up a lot of time because that movie is a a lot that but, would probably be like a two a two episode thing It'd have to be. But Rebecca here, this is something that's a lot more digestible because mm-hmm. there's nothing in this movie I would say is problematic. Like, this movie, I think, has aged like a fine wine. Like, there's there's some of those old Hollywood classics that hold up today that I can watch now and still be really engaged in. Because mm-hmm. the, the movie's like two hours long. I think there's some of it that's a little long-winded, but the performances in here are still good. Yeah. You can literally watch Laurence Olivier read a phone book, and it's fascinating. Joan Fontaine is amazing as this, like, neurotic, self-doubtful leading lady. And Judith Anderson, I'm not sure she's a real person. I think she's a (laughs) specter or a robot they got on set. It was interesting uh, watching Judith Anderson, who plays uh, Mrs. Danvers, Mm -hmm. because she reminded me so much of the actress that plays Dracula's daughter. There's just something about their faces. They look so similar, but they also have that, you know, I can look and not blink at the camera. I could just look kind of... Through you. Kind of through you, but also kind of be like a ghost. And I love that that's her direction in this film, is that she's very ghost-like, and she just kind of floats and disappears if she doesn't break you know her stare and it's creepy throughout the movie she never blinks you never actually see her take steps she 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 floats she floats she like glides Mm -hmm. across the floor you never see her dress move in any way that would suggest she's moving it's really weird she's like a living statue yeah but the thing is with like rebecca as a movie and its relation to Hitchcock, because I I read the book um, Hitchcock Truffaut. It's like mm-hmm. his interview book, and Hitchcock looks at this movie as like a compromised thing. He he likes it. He's like, oh, I think it's held up pretty well mm-hmm. the twenty years it's been out. I think that book was made in the sixties, but he's like, oh, the movie's good. The Truffaut like, book. The not Truffaut. The, not the Rebecca. Truffaut book. Yeah, yeah. This movie was made in nineteen forty, yeah. so it's uh, eighty years old. Yeah, and the original book was released in 1938, so there's only like a, a two-year difference at most between the book and the film. Yeah, but the thing is, Hitchcock's, like, the movie I think really holds up. It's a really well-crafted piece, but it's not... Hitchcock never claimed it as a, as a Hitchcock film. No, I, and I can see why, because it's not, you know, full Hitchcockian, especially with uh, David Oselznick, you know, being there and kind of okay, you know, yeah, I'll let you do this, but you're going to have to compromise and do something else the way I want to do it. And Hitchcock kind of, like, having to outwit him and outsmart him with, yeah, sure, I'll I'll let you think you're, you know, doing everything your way. And I like how you say outwit and outsmart him, where Hitchcock was just like, I'll just cut in the fucking camera and give you nothing else to use. Exactly, and and that's genius. You know, you do the dailies, and it's like, well, I shot what I needed to shoot for the day, 
And, well, there's not much, you know, fat on there to trim, so I guess we're going to have to go through with this unless you want to go back and film, you know, another day of the same scenes. And it just costs you more money, mm-hmm. and he put a lot of money in Gone with the Wind, and he did not have that wiggle room to get with nope, Rebecca. not yet. And that's the, but that's the thing with this movie. You know, Hitchcock calls it a compromised Hitchcockian mm-hmm. film, but he's still able to, like, make it work. Um, but we should probably tell people what the movie's actually about. So, let's fish out the box. Oh, yes, let me... All right. I, I found it. Uh, there we go. All right, do you want to, you want to, you want to read this one off? No, you have a beautiful speaking voice. I think you should do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, It's a a two-pack-a-day habit. It gives me this voice. A shy lady's companion, staying in Monte Carlo with her stuffy employer, meets the wealthy Maxim de Winter, played by Sir Laurence Olivier. She and Max fall in love, marry, and return to Manderley. 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 His large country estate in Cornwall. Cornwall? Cornwall? Cornwall. Cornhole. Max is still troubled by the death of his first wife, Rebecca. In Hello. A... <laughs> she died in a boating accident the year before. Oh, no. Ah, you, you should be very concerned around water. The I second, like water. The second Mrs. De Winter, played by Joan Fontaine, clashes with the housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, played by Dame Judith Anderson, and discovers that Rebecca still has a strange hold on everyone at Manderley. Manderley. Lay. Lee? Lay. Definitely lay. And, uh, yeah, so... Joan Fontaine shows up, she's basically being beat down by the memory of this Rebecca character that we never mm-hmm. see, and no. I think that's genius. Oh, yeah. We get beat down by this specter, this ghost of a person, and everyone's trying to mold her into Rebecca, mm-hmm. to the point where it's kind of driving her a little insane. And then twist ensues, because there's like three twists in the last 30 minutes of this movie? And it's just like, man, you think, okay, most movies, one big twist. Hitchcock's like, nah, I'm going to throw three at you in like 45 minutes. Yeah, it's like, oh, there's the, most movies are like, you know, one one good one. You know, like The Sixth Sense or something like that. There's, mm-hmm. oh, what's a twist? Mm-hmm. But yeah, this one has like three stacked up in like 10 minute intervals of the last 30 minutes. Yeah. But and uh, it, yeah. it's fun. I mean, it's been a long time since I've watched it in its entirety. Mm-hmm. Um. It's always a thing, like, if it's on, I catch, like, maybe the ending of the movie or the middle of the movie. But to see it, you know, from beginning to end and just seeing, you know, their story and their romance and how Rebecca is this dark shadow over the relationship. And it's like, you know, she's never, you know, she hasn't been there. She isn't the dark shadow. What? Oh, Rebecca? Yeah. She is a dark shadow. She's a specter that lords over this entire movie in a genius way. Yeah, but it's mostly, you know, Mrs. Danvers is the one that's, you know, orchestrating this shadow. Yeah, Mrs. Danvers is definitely one holding the torch out, and I wanted to talk about that. Okay, so Mrs. Danvers in the book, Mm -hmm. the reason she's obsessive about Rebecca is because she raised her up since, like, like childhood, right? Mm -hmm. She's like basically her her mother she's the dark force that turns rebecca dark basically kind of versus this movie where she comes in when rebecca is a bride and rebecca's kind of the bad influence on her i don't know if we get that but but that's the my question mrs danvers in the movie she is very obviously coded as being a lesbian and that's something that shows up in, I think, almost all Hitchcock films where he has a gay-coded character mm-hmm. in, like, every one of his movies. Yeah, because, I mean, I mean, even if she is, you know, lesbian or not, she's very obsessed with Rebecca to the point of, you know, I still do things like she's going to come home later that day. And that's the thing. Do you think that Mrs. Danvers is so obsessive about Rebecca because she is madly, like, in love with her and then she died? Because she seems more affected by Rebecca's death than Maxim is, and Maxim's not affected the same way for reasons we'll get into in a minute. Yeah. Well, talking about Mrs. Danvers because she's, like, the most interesting character in this fucking movie. Oh, yeah. I, again, I think she's a Terminator. But do you think... And also, think... spoiler, she has one of the coolest deaths in this movie. Oh, yeah. By far. But that's the thing. Do you think that's the main crux that Hitchcock was going for? That, oh, Mrs. Danvers is a 
the evil lesbian who's going to destroy Manderley because, you know, she was jilted by Rebecca and Maxim and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, I was kind of trying to figure that out, too. It's like, I don't know if it's because she was in love with Rebecca or it was just she was just very obsessed with this person. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, you know, you took my everything away from me and I'm going to take everything away from you because, you know, yeah, she is her, you know, personal, I guess, handmade would we consider that or her I, it's really weird because this is steeped in like one is steeped in like old school british mm -hmm. culture and it's steeped in very high class um aristocracy kind of british culture yeah. so manderley is this like fucking castle yeah it's and massive. there's so many like weird servants and there's servants for different rooms of the house and mm -hmm. there's servants specifically assigned for oh, this is your morning maid or whatever. And it's very weird because I think Mrs. Danvers was supposed to be her, like, personal confidant. It it almost feels like Mrs. Danvers was what Joan Fontaine's character was to the, to, to that pompous lady at the beginning. She was, like, her, like, companion. Her companion. Companion, which would be, like, an assistant now. Uh, companion's different. It's, like, a companion back then was... You were paid to be someone's assistant, mm -hmm. their secretary, and also their friend. Yeah. And you would just travel around with that person and you would hang out with them and take care of whatever they needed. That, that's why I, I would say, like, in modern times, we would just call it an assistant because, you know, you're constantly together. So, yeah, you would kind of hopefully, you know, build a friendship. So it's like, oh, cool, you're my assistant. You do things for me, but also you're my paid friend. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, companions as a job thing is weird because you're like, oh, I'm your secretary. But also, when you need to, like, you know, a wingman at the bar, I also have to do that because that's yeah. what you pay me for. Or, man, she broke up with you. I guess I'm your companion, so we're going to sit here and drink and play N64 until you feel better. Yeah. Like, that seems like such a weird job now. That's like an entourage situation, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have a job. You're just, you know, rich guy's friend. Entourage. Entourage. But yeah, so I, I Mrs. Danvers though, I feel like that was her deal with Rebecca. Like she was like her companion. Yeah, I think I'd have to well, I mean, again, you know, she raises her in the book and that's how we have like this obsessive thing because she feels like that's her child. Yeah, and but in this it, movie, you know, it, Rebecca, that AJ ain't working out though. No, so you know, it's this thing where you know she tells the audience that you know I was brought on to be her personal maid when she you know became the missus in this house. So it could be a thing where you know she's either in love with her or she just becomes beguiled and obsessed with her because whenever anyone talks about Rebecca, they talk about how she's the most beautiful creature they've ever seen. And she was the life of the party. She was so smart. She was so elegant. She could do all these things. And then you have Joan Fontaine playing the new Mrs. De Winter. And mm -hmm. we're going to call her by her by her actual name, the actress's name, because in the movie, she's never named. She's not. And I know you said in the book she has a name. I looked it up online and it says in the book she's called just Mrs. De Winter. She's not called by any name. I, I so, might, again, I might be wrong, because my memory of the book book is very uh, scattershot. Like, I remember the plot beats. I remember mm -hmm. things burning down. I remember the twist. I remember kind of the setup, but I didn't really remember all the details. And, and even one of the twists in the movie is changed from the book because of... The production the, code. Production code, the censors. So it would be interesting to see if they'd gone, you know, beat for beat with the book. This is pretty close. It, it's very close. Like, there's only... The things that are cut out of this are really minor things. Like, a lot of exposition scenes that you don't need in a movie because you can show it visually. Mm -hmm. All that shit's cut out. Yeah. And the only main plot beats, I think, that are changed are Mrs. Danvers' relationship to Rebecca mm -hmm. and the way in which she died. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two things that are, like, plot-specific that are switched up. And we'll... We can talk about those if you want. Yeah, I mean, this is a this movie's been around for a very long it's, time. It's an eighty-two year old movie. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's in its eighties. Uh, the book's even older. So uh, the the book was actually written by uh, Daphne Daphne du Maurier. Du Maurier, and uh, I had to say it in the most obnoxious French accent I could. Well, Daphne you, du Maurier. Well, you also took French in high school, so yes, two years of French in Southern California public school. 
We oui, we oui, monsieur. That's my <laughs> French right there. So yeah, so you know, it's interesting that you know this book was made and it was turned into this film and everyone loved the book and the movie. It's very rare when you kind of get, you know, love for both. It's either, you know, hit or miss. But this one, you know, everyone just knocked it out of the park. Well, that's the thing. And that that goes to David Oselznick because he had this opinion about adapting books into movies mm-hmm. and all that stuff was you need to maintain a slavish devotion to your material because fans are going to be angry if you change too much from the original material to make your movie. Yeah. So that's why like Gone with the Wind is like pretty book accurate and that's also why it's four hours long. Yeah, because I mean if you see a Gone with the Wind book like original hardcover. That is a weapon. I mean, I don't think I could take that on an airplane. I'm trying to like compare it to other books, like um, maybe like The Joy of Cooking. The or, Stand is you know, a good good one because I think The Stand's like over a thousand pages. Like a medical book, like an old medical book. It's like this, you know, they've got a lot of meat packed into this book. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, also, I wish people took a page out of Selznick's books now, just like. <laughs> Just just keep it up. Just, just stick to the book. Yes, keep it as authentic and as accurate to the book. That's what the readers want. And even if people are coming in as moviegoers and then they really enjoy it and, oh, it's a book, and then they read the book and they're like, wow, I saw that so I can kind of, you know, connect the two. Yeah, I mean, there's there's books and movie adaptations that are, like, in name only. Like, iRobot is in name only. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel they bought the rights to that book to use robots in the name and that's yeah. it but with this it's it's a very accurate telling of the story it's almost to the point where it's the exact same story just told by two different people mm-hmm. so you know d- do what you will i i will say though the book is kind of dull it mostly because it's like long witted and very 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 british there are multiple passages where they talk about cricket and crumpets i'm not making a joke that is, there's a whole chapter dedicated to a cricket match. And I can't agree with him because I have not read the book. But I will continue to watch the movie because the movie is very entertaining. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is another movie that Hitchcock decided to film in black and white because he wanted to keep with the the atmosphere and the mystique. And I think that works because, I mean, the fog, the the beach, the ocean, it's like you really feel like you're getting immersed and kind of lost into manderly oh yeah i i actually made a note because we have our first act of the movie where max and uh joan fontaine meet Mm -hmm. and it's like oh they're speed running through like a whirlwind romance Mm -hmm. drama but and that's like really bright and nice and it's a lot of natural lighting and it's really pretty yeah you know in monte carlo but then when they get to manderley it is they're in a gothic castle it is dark it is gloomy you it could, rains as soon as they hit the property you could film a universal monster movie on this set and the thing is about manderley that i think is so interesting is even though this movie is made in like 1940 manderley looks so much older and alien to what we've seen in the movie up to that point because yeah. monte carlo oh it's like nice extravagant but it looks you know I guess not, like, modern by our standards, but no. it looks like, oh, no, that, like, can't exist. Like, I could probably go to, like, a a restaurant, and it would kind of look like that. Or, you know, you go to any um, famous hotel in Monte Carlo, and it's probably kept in the same style because that's what it's known for, and we'll just, you know, keep it clean, keep it, you know, it it has looking... like It has, like, an Art Deco thing going yeah, on. Yeah, you know, you want to go with that vibe and... You know, that's how it feels in this movie. Like, we're we're jumping from modern to... Ancient? It, it's because it feels like when they get to Mandalay, just like in the movie, right? Because mm-hmm. everyone in Mandalay is trapped in the past in the memory of Rebecca. Yeah. And the house itself is the same way. It's mm-hmm. trapped in the past in the memory of Rebecca. Like, whole rooms haven't been changed. Mm-hmm. Her monogram is still written everywhere. Her signature's on a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. But the building itself is like, yeah, it's obviously an ancient castle, but the interior is like, oh yeah, no, we're feeding into that. Yeah. This is something out of time. It doesn't really exist in normal space. It exists in, in Manderley. Manderley. Mander, yeah. And I think that's an interesting thing about the movie and Hitchcock filming in black and white, 
is maintaining that mm-hmm. dark gothic atmosphere. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting to see it and kind of see it with Psycho, because we get mm-hmm. this, you know, this ominous character that's kind of, you know, really pulling the strings, but not really pulling the strings, and, you know, these places that have been around for such a long time, but nothing ever changes in them. Mm -hmm. Time changes around them, but these things are a constant. It's like they're in their own little time capsule. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at. It's the same day over and over again, and we're waiting for these people that are no longer with us to return, even though they're not going to. I was trying to figure that out because the movie it's it's trying to say something, mm-hmm. right? Hitchcock's, you know, yeah, was kind of buttoned down by Selznick, but like there's there's meaning and messaging and themes yeah. in this. And it's like, is the movie trying to be about grief? Is it trying to be about like memory? Is it trying to be about love and what love really means? You know, because like Maxim, he's in love with you know, the new Mrs. De Winter because she's the exact opposite of Rebecca. Yeah. Rebecca was this extravagant, elegant mistress of, of the aristocracy and she was all these things and Joan Fontaine's character, Miss, the new Mrs. De Winter, makes a point that she is so different than Rebecca. She's like, she's a working girl, not like a work working girl, but she's a working class girl. Yeah. And she's like, not very bright. Like, she's clever but she's not not the sharpest tool in the shed she's not really talented in anything she likes to draw which was like the one hobby that rebecca did not master in her life yeah and she doesn't really have a sense of fashion she they they point out that she wears like jc penny off the rack clothes yeah, she dresses comfortably versus rebecca who, who wants to be extravagant extravagant wants to be dripped in jewels and you know costume parties yeah, so we see, you know, how they kind of, you know, size up the new Mrs. De Winter and how cleverly uh, Daphne Du Maurier. Yeah, Du Maurier. Uh, and Hitchcock. You call her Daph. It's fine. Uh, I don't think I'll do that. But how clever they are with, you know, making us feel like this woman, you know, can never, you know, really be the, the love of Maxim's life. It's, you know, it's always going to be Either we're going to shape you into something that looks like Rebecca, or we're going to give you the boot after a while because you can't, you know, stand in her shoes. And I love how that is all in Joan Fontaine's head. Yeah. It's not something, like, Maxim never wants her to be like Rebecca, and he actually is, like, angry when she tries to be like Rebecca. And he's telling her, you know, even in the, the days that of this world when romance, you know, Never dress in a, a black satin dress and pearls. You know, don't do this, don't do that. And then we find her either being duped into doing that, or she thinks, you know, maybe this is the way he'll only love me if I buy new clothes and, you know, fix myself up. It's the thing where everyone around her wants her to be Rebecca, except the one guy she cares about. I, I think that's the best part about this movie and this relationship and, and the psychology of this film is we are so stuck in Joan Fontaine's character that we as the audience are like, why are you, why did Maxim pick you? Mm-hmm. Everyone loves Rebecca. Yeah. I don't know anything about her. I'm like, yeah, Rebecca seems awesome. What 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 are you doing here? Mm-hmm. And then you start getting into her head and being like, well, how could she change to be more like Rebecca? What will actually turn the ties to make Maxim love her? Yeah. But we see that, you know, if we just paid attention to Maxim things, he loves her already. He fucking married her. And it's like, we turn into like a Mrs. Danvers type where it's like, why aren't you more like Rebecca? And it's it's a really fascinating movie and how it's told and how it puts you as the audience in that mindset. I mean, you know, Maxim, his character as well, also doesn't help because he's so reserved and guarded. Very aloof. Very aloof. That's a good word. Where you feel like, you know, yeah, am I just around because... I'm, you know, someone that he kind of wants to have as a companion, and that's about it. Am I just an easy lay, Laurence Olivier, <laughs> you bastard? You beautiful, beautiful man. I look that I, man is gorgeous. I, I, I think, I think I've done this before, but I, again, very straight. But Laurence Olivier, he can mm, get it. Yes. I, how also that's another weird thing because how old is Olivier in this? 
That I'm not sure. Because this comes out in 1940, and mm. I think he's born in... 07. 07. Okay, so he's 33 in this, right? Okay. So, oh, fuck me, 33? Because he's in Spartacus in 1960. Mm-hmm. So he's like... This motherfucker didn't age for 20 years. Good genes. I, I guess. I Also, this is weird random trivia fact that I know, uh, but... Did you know that in Spartacus, for the um, oyster scene, really famous scene that was cut out of mm-hmm. the movie, they lost the audio for Laurence Olivier's voice in that scene, but it's in the movie. So they got in the one actor who can do a perfect Laurence Olivier impression to redub the scene, and it is seamless. And that is Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yes. Yeah, Anthony Hopkins. I knew that trivia fact, because you tell me that quite often i i just love that fact that anthony hopkins has a pocket olivier impression that he could just whip out at parties so good but whatever i just wanted to point that out Lawrence olivier really good in this movie you're so happy i love pulling out that that <laughs> uh, trivia that oh, is my, i know that is my favorite like movie trivia ever because it's like you got you got an oscar winning actor to impersonate another oscar winning actor as like a cocktail trick and that made it into a fucking movie it's fucking great well, yeah, when your back's up against the wall, go for it. All right. Oh. But yeah, I mean, Laurence Olivier is fantastic in this movie. And I mean, it just, you know, that's why you feed into the new Mrs. De Winter, because you feel like everyone wants me to be Rebecca. Mm-hmm. Even my new husband wants me to be her. And it's like, I love him so much, but it's like. Do, and and you would do a lot to try and win over Laurence Olivier's affection. <sighs> I mean. I don't know, but it's <laughs> it's hard for, you know, that scene when they're watching, like, the videos from their um, their honeymoon. Yeah. And, uh... Which, that, that's not original to the... That's original to the movie. That's original to the movie. Yeah. It's not in the book. But she asks him, because, you know, they get into the conversation, and she's like, you know, well, would you love me more if, you know, I was more like her? And she's like, you know, do you even love me at all? And he's kind of like, he's like, I don't know how to answer that. And it's like, yeah, you feel like, wow, I am a companion. I am, you know, just someone to kind of fill the void a little bit. I'm just a slam piece. Uh. Yeah. And then, you know, later on we learn that he feels like he's being haunted right by Rebecca, that it's like, I can't allow myself to let anybody in or love anybody because she's going to ruin that for me. And it's like, finally, we, we've we broken the wall and we see, you know, the real Maxim. And, that, and we get that once we get the twist. Yeah. All right, uh, I guess spoilers for an 80-something-year-old movie. Here's the twist. So, Rebecca, in I, in the plot synopsis we mentioned earlier, she dies in a boating accident. Mm-hmm. Not true. What happened was she revealed to Maxim that she was having an affair and was having a child with her cousin. Quotation marks. Quotation marks. Uh, and she says, I'm going to have this baby... And you're going to have to raise it because you won't tell anybody because that'll cause a scandal and it'll ruin you because you're, you weren't man enough to get me pregnant. So he thro- so he like kills her in a fit well, of rage. That and she also adds on to that, that, you know, you're going to raise this child and this child is going to inherit everything that you own, your family history. He's going to take it all from you and you're going to have nothing. Your family, you know, your and name ends with somebody who's not even you. Yeah. And so he kills her in, like, a fit of rage, and he's like, oh, God, I can't believe I did this. So he hides the body by basically sinking her and her boat out mm-hmm. in, the, in the lagoon or lake or yeah. river. Ocean. The ocean. Yeah. And she, and he tells this to, you know, Joan Fontaine, and he's like, yes, the the reason I did it was because Rebecca was a horrible human being mm-hmm. and a total bitch, and... In no uncertain words, like, how he describes her is like, a, she's like a monster. Yeah, and he, he tells her that he found out fairly early in their marriage that she was this different person versus what everyone has seen. Incapable of love, was and, his words. Yeah, and it was this thing where he goes, yeah, you know, she revealed things to me that, you know, I promised that I would never speak of, and he doesn't speak of them in the movie. And it's just like, I couldn't, you know, respect her after that. So it's like my God, you know, what were the things that she told him that she was just this horrible person? But she has that effect on people where she could just kind of, you know, get you under her spell and pull you in. And I think that's... It's the charm of a psychopath. Yeah, and I feel like that's, you know, what we have with Mrs. Danvers in this movie is that she was just kind of, you know, under her spell 
And she is still under her spell throughout the entire movie, even though she's been dead for over a year. Yeah, and then you get the, the second twist on it. because, And this is like, you know, a kind of the production code twist that mm-hmm. mandated on the movie. It did happen in the book, but differently. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we we find out later when they're doing the investigation. Because they finally find Rebecca's body and they're... In the boat. In the boat. And they're doing the investigation because... Oh, she couldn't have sunk. She had to have been murdered. Most foul. Well, it was a thing where they were making a point that, you know, she was very skilled at boating and sailing. And because it, Rebecca's perfect. Of course. I mean, she couldn't draw, but she could, you know, be a boater. But it was just a, this... A boater. I can't think of it. A, a sailor? A yachty? A, a yachty? No, yachty, yachty, yachty. Sprat still is my soda. Sprat still. That... <laughs> okay. Okay. The only thing I know about Little Yachty is that he did the Sprite commercials uh, for like the AMC or I think they were on like TV. So I know nothing of his songs. I know nothing about the man other than Sprite still is my soda, which is uh, a banger. All right. Dancing to that at my wedding. Okay. But yeah, so. But uh, yeah, so. You know, we learn through multiple people that she, you know, is experienced with boats and, you know, okay, she wouldn't do this intentionally. She wouldn't wouldn't sink the boat or she would know how to save herself, basically. So why would she kill herself if she's this, you know, beautiful, rich woman? What does she have? You know, what reason would she have to kill herself and take her life and deprive the world from Rebecca? And then this gets into Hitchcock's suspense of, mm-hmm. will they find out that Maxim killed her? Will they think it was uh, suicide? Uh, like, what's going on? And we find out that what happened is Rebecca did kill herself, but not in the way we thought. No. So she, they find out that she has cancer, or she had cancer. Yeah, because her pretend cousin. <clears throat> no, her actual cousin. Well, pretend, in, cousin, whatever. No, no, that Rebecca was, was banging her actual cousin. Like, that, that's that's very clear in the book and in the movie. That's her actual cousin. Yikes. But yes. uh, it's this thing where they're having this investigation because, I guess, you know, I don't know if it's this town or the laws at the time, you have to have an investigation about this person's death, and even though it's, you know... We have those laws now. But I know, but... Yeah, but, yeah the, but how for, they're doing it, the inquiry, it's played up for the movie yeah because you know maxim's already you know um proven that the body was hers the first time you know they found a body and then it was like no i actually you know misidentified and they're like oh we understand and you know you were grieving at the time but we still have to go through this inquiry again because that's just the law and her cousin is just like you know follow me exhibit a exhibit b and you know this leads them to going back to London because, you know, that's where she would go to bang it out with her cousin, but also her other doctor was over there. Is your concept of this movie ruined now that I point out that she was in an incestuous relationship with her cousin? It's not ruined, but it's just like, bruh. Did you just think he was a pretend cousin this whole time? Well, no, because it's like, you know, I am, I'm not. It's like, well, which is it? Yes, no. I don't think he ever says he's not his, he's not her cousin. Still, I wouldn't be, you know, boasting that. Uh, but they they go to wowing his his hot cousin. <sighs> so gross. Are they from Alabama? Is that what the secret mm. of this movie is? But uh, so Rebecca, you know, she's basically living this double life that Maxim is aware of. Everyone else is not. They just assume, oh, she's gone to London just to, you know, be to, Rebecca and, and do wonderful things because she's awesome. She's to, probably going there to save puppies from an orphanage. Visit family, visit friends, you know, do whatever, you know, glorious things in London. But then we find out that she has a doctor over there that she's been going to for years. But she's going under Mrs. Danvers' name. She never gives the doctor her own identity. Yeah. And, you know, this inquiry leads Maxim, the cousin, everyone over to London where they find out that she had been diagnosed with cancer, and the doctor tells her, you know, you basically have months to live. They never express what kind of cancer it is. It's 1940. It's it's magic movie all over cancer. Yeah, so it's this thing where it's like, you know, yeah, we found this mass that couldn't be operated, and the doctor goes, well, I do remember from that day, she tells me, you know, oh, it's going to be a lot sooner than months. And that's when we get the, you know, oh. the, the, you know the aha moment, but also... The stomach unclenching moment where Maxim thinks, you know, I've, you know, murdered my wife all these years. And it's like, 
No, it was an assisted suicide. Yeah, basically Rebecca pushed all of Maxim's buttons to make him kill her. Mm -hmm. With granted, her mindset was, "I'm going to make him kill me, and then that'll ruin him." Yeah, because Rebecca, as we've noticed, is kind of a bitch. Yeah, and it's a thing where he strikes her, and then she falls, and she hits her head on like fishing equipment. Yeah, and in, in, in the movie, she whacks her head. In the book, Maxim like shoots her dead. Oh yeah, it's intentional in the book, but with the censors. They're like, we can't do this. And it's also Lawrence Olivier, so we don't want him to be, oh, you were a Oh, he killer. makes a great villain, though. Yeah, so... Oh, my God, he's a, such a good villain. Spartacus, Richard III. But that but that is the thing. It, 1940 production the codes. They mm-hmm. That was their thing where, hey, if it was an accident and technically he didn't murder her, she killed herself and just used him to do it, mm-hmm. then he could get a happy ending, right? Yeah, right? and it's like, you know, we can't be too mad at him. He gets to have his happily ever after moment with the woman he actually wants to be married to. Yeah. I mean, he, he even makes a point where she was still smiling after she died. And it was just kind of like this, ha! <laughs> that that <laughs> even evil death, bitch. It was like, even in death, ha! I got you. Ugh. <laughs> but, and then that leads to the end of the movie where we see, you know, Mrs. Danvers when she realizes that Rebecca killed herself. And she couldn't even confide in Mrs. Danvers that she had cancer. Mrs. Danvers burns down Mandalay. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's because of this. Jack lights the match for Mrs. Danvers because he's the one that, right after they find out how Rebecca dies, his first thing he says is, I gotta tell, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Danvers. Danvers. And he runs to a payphone to call her and tell her. And, you know, she's just so, I I don't want to say distraught. I think this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It was just, you know, I thought I knew you. I thought, you know, I was your confidant. And it's like, you couldn't even tell me that you were sick. Or, you know, if you wanted to die, you couldn't, you know, let me help you be there, you know, in those final moments. I think what it is, is Mrs. Danvers constructed the perfect Rebecca out of Mm -hmm. her memories. And like all the stuff in her rooms and all the like... The stuff in the house. She had constructed the perfect Rebecca. Yeah. And her dying tragically from drowning. And that just, like, added to the mystique. She she could be like, oh, she died like this saintly martyrdom death. She was mm-hmm. too perfect for this world. So nature itself had to take yes. her away. And when she finds out that not only did she lie to her and, cons- and killed herself... And took her, you know, self away from this, but it was also, like, implications that she knew that, you know, her cousin was banging her. And, like, mm-hmm. basically Mrs. Danvers finds out that her construction of Rebecca was a complete lie. Yeah. And her only response she could come up with that is, well, I built Manderley to be this um, altar to this memory that's mm-hmm. a lie, so she must burn it down and dies with it. Yeah, and it makes sense because it's just, you know, I have created this false narrative for myself because I can find solace in it. I can pretend like if I keep things perfect, if I keep things the way that she liked it, one day she'll just come magically walking through those doors again and everything will be okay. And after finding, no, she was really sick. She wasn't the person that I had built up in my head, you know, of her being, yeah, let's burn shit to the ground and I'm going to go along with it because what else do I have to live for? And and that's the thing where I find Mrs. Danvers so fascinating because she's the one that builds the the altar of memory. Mm-hmm. Maxim, yeah, he kills her, but he's trying to run away from that. He feels guilty as yeah. hell over it, but he is trying to repress that memory. And then we have Joan Fontaine trying to live up to that memory. And that's kind of like the interesting thing here about the movie that I think is so compelling when I'm watching it is all three of these main players of this movie each works as a function of how people deal with somebody yeah. when they die or somebody when they lead or, or what however you want to put it and it's a really well told story and a well acted story because I get everything from these actors when they're going through it. Yeah. Like Mrs. Danvers breakdown, that fucking weird wide eyed look that, Mm -hmm. that, that how she walks through and the flames are all around her. And she seems like she's not even there. And when things collapse around her, I'm like, Oh, 
I completely understand that this mo- that this woman is at absolute bottom end grief. Yeah. And it's so, so good. And then, you know, you have the music swell up as Joan Fontaine and Maxim embrace because, oh, thank God, Mrs. Danvers has burned down our home. Fuck that bitch. And we're happily ever after. And we could rebuild again. It's okay. We'll, we'll build a new house. Uh, yeah. But Rebecca as a film, Hitchcock's entry into Hollywood... How do you think this works as a Hitchcock film? Not like a movie in general, but in Hitchcock's canon. Would you call this like, on a scale of, you know, five birds? Uh, <laughs> where, where would you put this on Hitchcock's scale? Five being um, vertigo and zero being, I don't, I don't fucking know, uh, topaz or something. I'm going to go four. Four? Pretty Hitchcockian? I'll go 4.5. Really Hitchcockian. Really Hitchcockian. I mean, the only stuff that isn't going to make it a five is where it feels like an old Hollywood movie where it's, you know, we're happy and there's a romance and it's just... Where you can see a compromised Hitchcock. Yeah, you know, this movie, it's kind of like, you know, the happiness goes flying out the window, you know, very, very fast in this movie. Because it's... You know, this romance just, you know, that takes over and then, you know, reality sets in of, you know, who did I marry? And then the twists and the turns and the shadows and, you know, the staff that just appear and disappear and these new strange characters that pop up into the house. I and- love, I love that about the staff because even when Joan Fontaine's wandering around the house, there's no one there. But as soon as she wants to be alone, suddenly there's a million staff mm-hmm. members there. And I'm like, where are all these people coming from? Where are they going? I mean, it's also creepy when she comes to the house for the first time and all the staff are like in this like entry hall that leads into the house. And it's just like, oh, my God, you know, it's just this group of people all kind of looking kind of depressed because the new Mrs. DeWinter is here and it's not Rebecca. It's this movie. And I think I got it. This movie is a ghost story without any ghosts. Mm hmm. We are in a haunted house that where no one's dead. Yeah. You know, these are just ghost inspectors going through the motions like they did with the previous owner. And this woman is going mad because she is surrounded by a bunch of people just clinging on to a memory. To a memory. Very good movie. Very good movie. And I'm so surprised that you enjoyed it as much as you did. I wasn't sure how you would like it. Why wouldn't I enjoy this? I... It's Hitchcock. There's an intriguing premise. There's great acting. Like the, Literally, like the only things I ask of in movies are, is the story interesting and are the actors good? Everything else is kind of gravy. Yeah, and I mean, this movie, it's a lot of fun. Even though it's a depressing movie because, you know, it's about grief and loss and and death and death and you know revenge betrayal and you know it's at the end of the day maxim just wants to be happy and so does mrs de winter she just wants to be happy and it's like they can't you know be regular people and just be happy right off the bat they can't get out of their own heads yeah it's a thing where they're in a they're in a, a misery loop because of the place they're in. Yeah. As long as Manderley stands, they will never be happy because Manderley stands as an altar to the woman that um, Mi- Mrs. De Winters can never live up to, mm-hmm. and the woman that Maxim despised so much that that you know she forced him to kill her. Yeah, and it's kind of symbolic in a way that uh mrs Devan- uh mrs danvers destroys the house but really she sets everybody free yeah you know she kind of breaks the curse of manderley and she and i like how she dies because she's the only one that wants to live in that memory yeah very good movie uh so <laughs> i guess do you, anything else you want to get to, or do you want to hit our final thoughts on Rebecca? Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about the making of this movie. Did you know that Joan Fontaine was not the original person that uh, David Oselznik wanted for... Uh... I, I do, because he wanted her sister, who was starring in Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Olivia de Havilland? Yes. She was uh, considered for the role. That was one of the people that he was pushing, but also... Olivier was really pushing for his girlfriend, 
who was also in Gone with the Wind. Oh, Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee. Lee. Thank you. And Hitchcock was like, absolutely not. And it was just like, please, like, absolutely not. Well, that's, and I think that's a really interesting thing about this movie's legacy is this movie is so tied with Gone with the Wind. Oh, yeah. Because Gone with the Wind was this giant vortex in this era of Hollywood. Because I, I don't think people under understand. It's like, because Gone with the Wind at the time was the most expensive movie ever made. Yeah. And to date, uh, adjusted for inflation, adjusted for inflation, it is the most profitable film ever made. It's the highest grossing film ever made. It's made more money than anything else. And that's that's because it's played in, that's because it played in theaters over and over and over again for decades before it hit on video. Yeah. But it's like, this has a bigger, like, cultural vortex than, like, Titanic and Avatar combined. Like, I don't think people understand how big Gone with the Wind was. Yeah, it was this larger-than-life movie, and, I mean, it's still generating money. Yeah. But it, it was just interesting to see, you know, the characters that other people wanted to bring in to be Mrs. De Winter. Yeah. And it was like, you know... It, how, how, how much you want to bet, like, uh, they were this close to being like, could we get that Clark Gable fella in here to play Maxim? They had a couple of other guys they wanted to be Maxim, but I think Lawrence Olivier was the perfect choice. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, this era, like, Olivier is the perfect choice for, for a dramatic leading man. Like, he does this, and he does Worth- Weathering Heights pretty yeah. soon around this time. And yeah, that movie I know won a bunch of Oscars, and yeah, he... Because I think... So good in this movie. I was trying to remember, was Joan Fontaine in Weathering Heights, or was she in Jane Eyre? I think she was in Jane Eyre, but don't quote me on that. Okay. okay. I haven't seen Weathering Heights in a long time, and I don't think I've seen Jane Eyre. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so. I know she was in The Women, and that was why Hitchcock had wanted her, because she played... They called her, like, the meek wife in The Women, and that movie is a great movie. I, I highly recommend that movie. But it was just the thing where he saw her in it and he was like, that is who we need for this movie. And I think these two leading characters were perfectly casted for, you know, who they are in this movie. Oh, yeah. I, again, like, Olivier is the, the acting Don in this movie. Joan Fontaine is the is the workhorse. She can carry this movie on her back. And, I, and the standout and the surprising performance is Judith Anderson as, as Mrs. Mrs. Danvers. Danvers yeah. Great performances all around. The story is compelling. The direction's so good. Did you know that Vivian Lee eventually got to play Mrs. De Winter? Oh, let me guess. Stage play? Radio. Oh, yeah. This this had a radio play? Yeah. I, I don't know how many years later, but Joan Fontaine reprised her role. Uh, Lawrence Olivia, he reprised his role, and he did, you know, a, a radio thing with his wife, Vivian Lee. Oh, okay. And then there was another one where Joe Fontaine reprised her character as Mrs. De Winter later on. So it was interesting that they actually came back to these roles and they played themselves again, which is, you know, kind of odd, you know, well, thinking now where a lot of actors are kind of like, I don't want to go back to this character that I already played. I don't want to be typecast. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the that's the thing that happens with a lot of people who do Marvel movies because mm-hmm. they do the Marvel movies for however long and then they want to get out of it. Like um, Chris Evans. Pretty famously, he's like, as soon as his Captain America contract ran out, he's like, I want to do something else immediately. Yeah. But, um, you know, if anybody wanted to watch this movie uh, they and, you know, not see any of these actors, this movie got remade this year. Yes. It's on it, Netflix? It was on Netflix. Uh, my mom watched it and she was like, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> well, that's the thing. This is such a, like, classic Hollywood kind of kind of story mm-hmm. and kind of movie that I really don't think this this plays well now. Here's the thing. This movie has aged really well, mm-hmm. but I couldn't you couldn't release this movie now kind of thing. I think people are looking for the twist. This kind of story has permeated a lot of like pop culture that everyone can kind of like cult shot it. Yeah. And even if it was more broke accurate and like maybe le- even a little sleazier, it wouldn't it wouldn't look right. I think... yeah, I mean, I think it's an easy movie to remake, you know, even if you wanted to give it a modern twist where it's a modern couple and, you know, the the wife 
you know, the previous wife dies and a new wife comes in and, you know, is the house haunted by, you know, the, the soul of this other wife. Well, that's uh, the thing. That sounds like so many of those, um, that sounds like a lot of these, like, movies about, oh, the last wife died and now the new wife has to come mm-hmm. in and the husband can't let it go. There's a lot of movies like that. Yeah. This one's unique in that it's done really, really well, and it's done at a time where you probably couldn't have gotten that made straight. This is made straight, which is so fascinating. Yeah. But uh, anything else you want to say about Rebecca? Rebecca? Uh, I mean, it's there's just a lot about this movie. It's an interesting movie, you know, behind the scenes stuff, the story itself. Um, a funny thing. Um, Selznick, he wanted, you know, at the end of the movie, we have the house burning down and we pan in on the embroidered pillowcase that Mrs. Danver makes for Rebecca with Mm -hmm. the the trademark R on it. Apparently, uh, Selznick, he wanted an R in a smoke form to appear and Hitchcock was like, absolutely not. I read that. He wanted the cheesiest Mm -hmm. fucking ham Fisted ending he could have made. So, Send the cheap seats home happy. That's David O. Selznick. So Hitchcock was like, sure, sure. And then when he was preoccupied with Gone with the Wind, he was like, yeah, we're going to shoot this and then we're going to tack it onto the end of the movie with the, you know, the panning in onto the pillowcase and then it ends and we're good and be like, oh, we tried it. It, it did didn't look good work. on camera. Yeah, it we- was really rough. Th- that is the story of how Hitchcock made the movie. Every time Selznick had to go do something for Gone with the Wind, he was like, all right, we're going to do it my way, and Selznick ain't going to care because he ain't coming back to reshoot it. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Selznick is, you know, obviously a talented person, but, you know, he... He's not Alfred Hitchcock. He's not Hitchcock. I mean, he, you know, not only gave Hitchcock probably a lot of headaches making this movie, but he also kind of started a controversy with two famous composers in Hollywood because of this movie. So, Ooh. apparently, uh, for this movie, because it's, I think it's on a list of, you know, one of the most epic or beautiful scores on AFI. One of their, you know, many categories. Something like that, yeah. Th- there was a point in, like, the 90s and early 2000s where they gave everything a category. So, instead of just having, like, one composer, like most films do, apparently he borrowed some of Franz Waxman's music. Franz Waxman, who was the composer of The Bride of Frankenstein. Mm. And then he also borrowed from Max Steiner, who was the composer of Gone with the Wind and many other movies as well, and kind of mishwashed their music into the movie. That He took pieces from other movies that they composed for, and I guess he kind of started a an animosity between both of the composers. Oh, yeah. Well, because if you mishmash two composers' musics together, mm-hmm. then neither of them can claim credit because neither yeah. of them actually composed it. Yeah. And the other thing is... They probably didn't work together, and mishmashing the two of them, if they can't get credit for it, and it's probably an under-contract deal, then those the, those musical scores, they don't get anything for it. Yeah, and it's not like now where, you know, there's copyright on everything, and everything is, you know, you know, you can't do it. We can't even do anything on YouTube with music, because we could get... Uh, we a, get copyright claimed every time. Yeah. yeah, so it's this thing where he kind of, you know, did this, and then stirred up more problems, and I was like, well... Got music for the movie, so I'm good here. So And we are good here. What are your final thoughts on Rebecca? Rebecca. Fun film. Uh, technically, my namesake, technically not. I really hope it's not, because I think, I think you're nicer than the Rebecca of this movie. <sighs> That's what they say, but I don't know. No, I'm a lot nicer than... This... Than, than the one that fucked her cousin and got her vo- husband to kill her out of spite? Definitely a lot better than that. A lot better than that. Yeah. I, but I, I think very highly of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. But, you know, it's kind of cool to have something, you know, that's kind of a part of Hitchcock history. It's yeah. it's just fun to, you know, to think of that. But uh, great movie keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time. Because, I mean, you're just so engrossed in this, you know, this ghost story. And then, you know, you finally get the veil pulled off your eyes and it's like, wow. You know, these are actually real people, real problems. Yes. And it's not a haunting. 
it's very compelling. It's very, very, very well done. Very beautiful. Very pretty, too. Yeah, the cinematography is very good. It's why it won an Oscar. An Oscar for it. Um, I think, again, like I said before, all the performances are great. All the acting is great. The production is great. I give this, you know, two big, massive thumbs up. Four out of five stars, which is pretty fucking high. For a Dean, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, number five's the fucking Godfather. I'm sorry. Was it? I, I thought, thought five star was the Godfather, and Once um, Upon a Time in America. No, I was gonna say Once Upon a Time in America is on that list too. Oh, I love, I love that movie. Uh, but yeah, so highly recommended. Definitely. And if you guys want to watch it, it's available for free on YouTube. Yeah, this one's actually in the public domain. You can just Google Rebecca 1940 and they have a nice HD copy. And there's no commercial breaks. So you can watch it all the way through. But what are we watching next week? Because you have the reins for the whole month. <sighs> That's right. This is my month. And we kind of mentioned the, me the movie for next week throughout this episode. We're going to be talking about Vertigo. Oh, I love Vertigo. One of my other loves. We have recently saw it on the big screen. I can't wait to talk about Vertigo. Oh, there's so much. The cinematography, the music, the acting. Yes, and also it's weird because of when we record these episodes and when they're released, because uh, this is currently when time of recording is Sight and Sound's number one greatest film of all time. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know if it'll maintain that, so we'll well, Bring that up. Well, how long has it been Sight and Sound's number one? Ten years. They do a they do a poll every ten years. Okay. So I in, thought it was a thing where they did it every year, and it's just maintained number one every no, year. No, it's it's every ten years, and they cast a, and everybody like in the industry casts a vote, like critics, directors, mm -hmm. act a lot of people, uh, and it's from around the world, so you get a really big pool of movies. And Vertigo was number one in 2012, and it dethroned Citizen Kane after. 40 years or mm -hmm. 50 years at number one and that was like a, a big deal but uh yeah so we'll talk about that it's gonna be nice but it's, where can they go to listen to that? it's basically schrodinger's box it's either gonna still be number one when we record this or it might not be number one <laughs> when we record this and who knows what's gonna take the new number one slot personally i think 2001 a space odyssey does but it, people have been saying citizen kane's gonna take the number one spot back or tokyo story is finally gonna do it because it's been number three for like 30 years but uh we're gonna find out we will and if you want to listen to us on a different platform than you currently are you can find us on anchor fm apple Podcasts, spotify and YouTube. Yeah, you can go to our YouTube channel, The Film Vault. That is The Film Vault on YouTube, where you can like, comment, subscribe, and watch the video versions of this podcast. But if you wanted to follow us on social media, you can go to The Film Club Podcast on Instagram, where we post daily stories, trivia, upcoming episodes, and just our random adventures that we go on. And with that, we'll see you next week at The Film Club. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.